Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Energy News Beat Podcast. My name is Stu Turley, President and CEO of the Sandstone Group. What does ESG mean to you? Does it mean wealth transfer? Is it actually trying to do something good? Well, today I have an outstanding guest. We're going to sit down. We're going to talk to Paul Tice with Race to Zero, how ESG investing will crater the global financial system in his new book. And I mean, it is fabulous. Thank you, Paul, for stopping by the podcast. It's great to be with you. I'll tell you what, this is a fabulous book. And you and I were kind of talking about this uh, just before the show started. Uh, the oil and gas industry has never really done a very good job on uh, bragging about how uh, elimination of energy poverty is something they've done very well. Why did you write this book? You know, I, I think the main reason was because even though the last two years we've had some pushback on ESG, you've never heard anyone who's worked within Wall Street or the financial industry offer up a critical view of sustainable investing. And right. I thought it was important to articulate that view because I think there is a silent majority that works on Wall Street that disagrees with this agenda, but they're right. afraid to speak up. And that's by design. You're really not allowed to have a dissenting opinion. And I kind of experienced that over the last few years of my career. You say dissenting opinion. Were you shut down as being a Wall Street exec? No, but my ability to write publicly, uh, which I've done Ooh. over my career, particularly over the second half while I was on the buy side. And I also have, have taught down at NYU Stern at the business school. Okay. So, you know, I've written publicly about the energy sector, which I've specialized in for the last 30 years, as well as climate policy and, and ESG and sustainability, all right. of which is interrelated. And, you know, literally over a decade, you know, my ability to express my own personal views, which again, didn't reflect on any of my employers, right. was slowly getting constrained. I could feel that I was running out of runway. And it got to the point where at, at one job, I was told by a senior manager that me having a different opinion from the CEO when it came to sustainability was a problem, which you know, <laughs> obviously is an amazing statement to make if you're working in the financial markets, because you need to have a difference of opinion for the markets to work. Right. Uh, so yeah, it is tough. Um, and I'm sure everyone else ex is experiencing that. And they're they're presented with the choice, either I say something um, and then I don't get paid or I lose my right. job. So that is a real risk for anyone speaking out. Wow. I I'll tell you, your book is so well laid out from a standpoint that as we sit back and take a look at climate change, how to invest. It started out with the ESG investing and then really constricting it down and saying, hey, this is where the money is going to go. And you nailed a comment that I want to kind of drill in in here, and that is sustainable. How did we come up with sustainable energy being wind and solar when we have to print money in order to get them installed they're not sustainable. They're not fiscally sustainable. Where did that come in? I think sustainable, you know, if you trace it back, it was really used as a slur against the oil and gas industry initially, back when, you know, people right. were talking about peak oil, right? So oil is not sustainable because we're going to run out of it, right? <laughs> and that obviously has been disproven for decades now with right. technology. So that, that was the original concept of sustainability. And that's kind of changed in the 1980s. And the United Nations is all involved with this intertwined agenda of climate right. sustainability and ESG. And they kind of changed the meaning of sustainable at that point. And basically it became that, you know, the progressive agenda, right. the long list of progressive goals over the last hundred years, all became sustainable goals for business and for investing. And, it, um, you know, you can't really argue that because they're arguing about the future. Right. Uh, so it becomes this theoretical discussion. But, you know, I personally believe that, you know, progressives don't want to talk about history, certainly not the 20th century, 
right. given how when they were given the opportunity to, to implement their progressive agenda, it went horribly wrong. So now they are just telling us that this will work in the future and to trust them. So right. it's a, it's an amazing concept, but there's a lot of inconsistency as as you know it in terms of what yeah. really is sustainable, what's green. Um, but logic has never really worked on on leftists. So no, it, it really hasn't. And and when we sit back and say sustainable fiscal responsibility from let's say offshore wind is zero from day one. I mean, you can they're not fiscally sustainable from day one. And now there are other things that when they come in and at eight years, the maintenance kicks in so badly as the, from the numbers that I've been seeing that now they're really kicking in at the seven year and eight year and refinancing these to put in new turbines, go and invest with the Inflation Reduction Act, get that extra money, and then start the clock running again on their tax benefits and everything else. So the the scam runs again. So instead of running 30 years, like everybody says, they last eight, they last seven, and then they go back in to double dip again. This cycle is the unbelievable on that. I'm anyway, I'm sorry, I'm digressing on that. Um, well, actually, it, I mean, electric vehicles probably fall in that same category where you don't really know what the useful life is, the battery life, what happens when you get into an accident. So the replacement cost, which I don't think is going to be subsidized becomes onerous and you almost have to jump the car over a very short period of time. So right. none of the economics work because the market's not driving this transition that we all keep talking about. It's politicians and you know, they're going to get it wrong. But to, I'll give you another example of, of sustainability being okay. kind of an ironic term. Exxon and Chevron we're told are not sustainable companies because they generate carbon emissions, but they've been right. around each for 140 years. <laughs> And then we have good. companies that focus on the ESG agenda, like Silicon Valley Bank last year, and right. they take their eye off the ball and they're gone because they mismanage interest rate risk. So sustainability implies solvency, but the two are completely different terms. What, you know, when you talk about ESG, let's take a look at the difference between the big oil uh, BP and total energy, as I say, from my Oklahoma, Texas accent, you know, you sit back and kind of go, hmm. And then they have Shell. They went really to the ESG and they were getting out of oil and gas. Chevron and Exxon kind of really stayed in this uh, mode of still, they're going to still keep doing it. They're going to try to lower their emissions. Oxy went totally into carbon capture. So they're, they're kind of like a third went, went out here. Now you see BP beyond petroleum and uh, Total and uh, Shell are now all in again on oil and gas and their CapEx is now going back in and they're having to play catch up to Shell on, to Chevron and Exxon. It's kind of funny how all that turned around. Yeah, it's if you look at ESG, uh, Europe um, is really the the uh, ground zero for right. all of these programs, climate, sustainability, and ESG. So it's not surprising that the integrated over in Europe, which mo all of them used to be state owned, and still right. have that in their DNA. I think that they would be embracing this because every government over in Europe, every bank, every financial institution, and every industrial also is on board. And, you know, it's not like they have a choice because they're passing regulations across the entire economy that's going to force this on them. But right. they did take the lead to try and make a good show of it that they were trying to play along. And what did he get them? Shell continues to be sued because, you know, their emissions reduction targets are not enough <laughs> with, with whoever wants to put up their hand now. So the fact that they're, they're now basically backtracking for economic reasons right? Uh, and mirroring the U.S. integrated, I think it's a good thing. It's just going to guarantee that there's going to be mo more lawsuits down the road. They were just sued, I believe, this week, uh, Paul, for uh, he was at a inclusion, uh, some kind of inclusion event. The CEO, uh, 
I can't remember who it was, but he was just sued for something, uh, something really stupid. It's amazing how many of them are going to be sued. Um, but when we, we take a look, Paul, at BlackRock, BlackRock, you know, I believe it was 2022, uh, first half of 2023, uh, they lost $1.7 trillion in the first half of 2023 because of their ESG investments. They've then they had uh, ESG investing hypocrisy going on because BlackRock actually had investments in pipelines in the Middle East and they had to quietly bury those in some of their financial things. So BlackRock, Larry Fink has now come out and said, well, wait a minute natural gas we need it so it's okay to invest now in and blackrock is publicly saying it's okay to invest in oil and gas do you think that investors are waking up that esg investing is harmful well obviously larry fink and blackrock have been a target of the opposition and right. they've, they've been sued because he's been a leading spokesman up until now and so he's made himself a target um, some of the numbers you quoted, I don't think we're, we're all directly related to ESG okay. investments. Um, they lost money in 2022 when the markets went down. Right. And, you know, so 1.7 trillion is, is way too high. So I think that was all just market moves and they've okay. made that back. So if you look at BlackRock, there's been some talk that there's been a tactical retreat on, on the company's part the last two years, right? right. They were out supporting the Exxon proxy battle that engine number one mounted, right? right? So they and the other big uh, index fund uh, managers uh, all voted in line with engine number one, right? And I and I think that was spun as a victory against Exxon. I don't think it's changed anything with the company. So that was much ado about nothing. But after that, there was a lot of fair criticism of passive fund managers like BlackRock who right. get to vote their shares when they're passive. So that's a real governance issue, I think, that ESG wow. is kind of exposed. Right. I think the, the remedy is that if you're a passive fund manager, basically you cede that vote back to management and they have to vote it according to their recommendation. I think that solves the problem. But what BlackRock did was they're now trying to farm that out to some of their investors and let them make the call. Right. But either way, they've made a uh, taken a lower profile around that. So some people have construed that to mean that they are backing away. I think it's a tactical retreat. I think basically they mm. and everybody else in the industry are now waiting for financial regulations to make this a mandatory system. And then it doesn't really matter if you're a true believer like BlackRock or somebody else who's just right. going along because you're afraid. Everyone's going to be forced to do that. Right. Now, you you mentioned the World Economic Forum, uh, and in it's a it's like a wealth transfer, if you would, for ESG and uh, spending, and the climate change and everything else. Um, it seems like the carries of the world get richer, and you and I are actually having to pay for the power bills. Um, you know, and and. Um, uh, I, the EIA just put out just recently that in 2008, we had, we've increased the wind and solar on our grids um, about 15%. But let's take California, they've had a 98% increase in their uh, uh, kilowatt per hour since then. And it's been because of the wind and solar being added onto the grid. It's almost 100% because of that. So when you sit back and take a look at the additional expenses coming in, the consumers get to pay for it. But then where does management come in in the ESG side of this thing to say, I have fiduciary responsibilities back to my investors? We're seeing this really come back around. Is that what you're saying on that? I think the problem with the grid is that the regulatory commissions at the state level yep. have been pushing intermittent wind and solar really since 20 years ago, you know, right. 2007. And, you know, I, I, I personally don't think you, you should allow intermittent generation into any grid, right? <laughs> Everything should be, it has to be dispatchable, right? Right. So I think that's your first problem because it can't run all the time. It was never cheap. 
if you back out all the subsidies. And right. now with, with interest rates in a more normalized pattern, it just exposes how expensive it is. Right. So, you know, I think that's the problem. And, and then when you have utilities that are regulated, they clearly have not been able to speak up since the 1930s, right? So you've right. got a problem there, which is putting the entire economy at risk because, you know, our economy runs on power. And now, you know, we're going to have unreliable grids and power outages will be the right. norm. Uh, and we haven't had to deal with that for 100 years. So I think that's the problem. I think with with companies, the, the fiduciary responsibility, well, first, the ESG side is trying to redefine fiduciary, right? right. They have been for the last several years. They're trying to redefine a fiduciary rule for an investor as well as for a company. And in their argument, if you're not managing ES risk and using ESG as a risk management tool, then that's bad governance, which is their circular uh, wow. self-serving argument. Yeah, um, But they have been lobbying that and, and they have implemented those tweaks to the fiduciary rule on the investment side that are already going into place over in, in Europe. And here the Department of Labor has done the same thing with the Biden rule that came right. out, which we're now challenging the courts. It, it's allowing for ESG uh, in a risk return analysis. And once you open that door, then it's gonna force everyone to that lower common denominator. Wow. When we, um, one of the things I really liked about your book is that you also had uh, at the end of it, the 30, 30 uh, exit plan. It seems like everybody's got these, um, we have to, these arbitrary dates, you know, it's kind of like when uh, we were younger, Oh, in 1977, the bears are all going to be dead. Or, you know, in 1980, uh, you know, there's going to be no polar caps. And now we have to be net zero by 2030. Uh, and all these numbers are out here. And the UN and the WF, I think we need to throw the UN. This is a personal opinion. Let's get the all those in favor of getting the UN out of the US. I, I'm all in. Just throw these rascals right on out. They're they're a bunch of morons. Um, and it seems like we're paying uh, a lot of this for the salaries of these folks. And then they're kind of doing damage to us. I mean, this is my purse. It's not in the book. You do a great job not articulating. That's just my opinion. Um, but in the book in 2030, we're not going to be able to get financially and fiscally to any kind of net zero. It's not going to be possible. Uh, why is suddenly uh, 2030 a real plan date for these? Do you, I mean, how is that a date there? I, I, well, you know, as you point out, you know, the progressives behind this whole intertwined agenda, they love setting target dates and they've missed a lot of them. <laughs> Their predictions have been way off and, and all the climate models have been wrong in real time, but they're, they're not stopping. So I think we need to re acknowledge the fact that, you know, they're not going to back away from this. And as you say, there are so many grifters who have made a career and a right. lifetime around pushing this ideology that they really can't back away from it at this point. So they're all in. So I think 2030, we need to respect with regard to what they want to accomplish. And the goal is not to be net zero by 2030, but by 2050. But that implies that they need to make aggressive uh, right. progress by the end of this decade. And if you look with ESG, they want to have a sustainable global financial system by 2030. On the climate side, the US and Europe both want to cut emissions by 50 to 55% versus 1990, which is going to apply a lot of economic shrinkage and right. lower living standards and probably energy and food scarcity in order to get there. Because what they won't acknowledge out front is that fossil fuels drives economic growth and capitalism. Right. You take fossil fuels away, we have nothing to transition to. That implies deindustrialization and degrowth, right? Which yep. some on the left actually view that as a as a as a goal and a right. good thing, which is crazy. So by 2030, we're going to see yeah. a lot of the pain already coming in place unless we can turn it around. Well, you know, um, Paul, we're already seeing the deindustrialization coming to the United States. Germany is being deindustrialized very nicely right now. 
Um, and there was an article that was just put out that said that they are really proud of how much they're reducing in their carbon output, but yet their economy is failing miserably. You have the BASF uh, plant shut down. You know, they've shut down their fertilizer plants. Uh, Volkswagen is now moving their plants out. Where does your economic freedom come in when you start shutting deindustrialization coming down because the high price of energy? Yeah, I mean, it's it's shocking how that has happened over the last two years with the, with the war in Ukraine kind of exposing that. Right. And that people just avert their eyes with regard to how many German industrials that have been around for 100 years went right. away when energy prices spiked. Was that their steel? St- that was their steel mill that, that shut down. It was their oldest steel mill and, and it shut down because it couldn't afford energy. Right, right. So that layer on top of that, what, what they're also doing in Europe is attacking agriculture, which shows you how you know extreme this climate argument is being taken. Um, they're trying to shut down farms in the Netherlands and the Netherlands feeds the rest of the continent, right? So that's right. something we need to acknowledge up front. They want to shut down 3,000 farms in the Netherlands because they're concerned about nitrous oxide, which is even more of a trace greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide and methane. <laughs> and, and if you look at the Netherlands, they've actually become more efficient as, as a farming uh, country, and they reduce their nitrous oxide and, and versus the total U.S., the total world number. Yep. It's, it's a rounding error. But still, they're they're pushing forward with this heart, this uh, attempt to shut down farming because we're hurting the planet, which just shows you that this whole agenda is anti-human. Uh, it is, uh, and so the the best thing that we can do as humans is to deliver the lowest kilowatt per hour to every single person on the planet, and that means use all forms of energy. It doesn't matter. But let's have, um, you know, natural gas and let's have uh, oil, clean coal. I mean, you can burn coal um, and do it quite fine with the new equipment, but we can't update our plants uh, because of the regulatory issues. We've got death through regulations going on right now. (laughs) Uh, It's also it's also when you look at they're trying to push this on the developing world at a certain level. And yes. putting putting those economies on intermittent power means that they will never grow, right? right? And they're lecturing, you know, we are lecturing, the UN is lecturing them on carbon emissions when what you really need to focus on is economic development and, and reducing poverty. I mean, if yep. you look at poverty levels in the world, they really haven't moved over the last 30 years that the UN has been focusing on this soft policy agenda, which right. is a crime. And all the development banks for the world, the World Bank, the regional development banks, they don't lend to oil and gas anymore. They haven't for the last four years, which I think is going to shut down a lot of projects, obviously, in the third world that they need. Right. Um, So, yeah, I was just visiting with um, uh, NJ uh, Anuk. He is the uh, director for the African Energy Chamber, and he is just a real cool cat. I really like him, and he is really trying to push Africa first. Let's let uh, let's take the industrial products, move manufacturing to Africa. Uh, let's put in natural gas plants. Let's put in all of these things. But the world economic, the world uh, international monetary fund will only fund green energy that is being produced in uh, the materials are produced in China. The kids, the child labor in the Congo is pulling out the things here. Why can't we help develop and then sell them other products as well? It doesn't make sense to me. I I really like the way NJ Anuk is talking about let's build a whole nother market let's let them have uh the natural gas let's let them have nuclear i mean it, it it's not our place to say you can only have wind or solar it, it doesn't make sense to me yeah i mean and then we're producing oil off west africa and we've got lng projects there and mozambique yeah. now is an lng producer and all of those hydrocarbons are going to the developed world in asia exactly. and europe exactly 
this right. this makes me air sick and i and quite honestly and, and if you think about it uh he has a great point of africa first and saying that wouldn't it be great to have the plants so that you get the higher paying jobs they're going to be buying more goods and services from the u.s all of a sudden you're building your own you know new market to sell things to it just makes good business sense to me to be a humanitarian i'll, I'll give you another example you know chenier when they built Sabine Pass, yep, it was originally going to be an arbitrage with Asia because LNG prices were so high over there. Right. But what they found over the you know the first ten years in production is that Latin America and South America became a new market for them mm. because of all the the political dysfunction in that continent right. where they were sitting on gas, but they couldn't move it by pipeline from one country to the other. Right. Um, and obviously you have a, a lot of instability. So the U.S. in the Gulf Coast is producing LNG and shipping it down to the Andean countries because they can't exploit their own domestic natural reserves, which is crazy at a certain level. Um, it, and it, it is just really sad. Also, you know, uh, you talk about uh, it takes a, a village uh, to raise an idiot. Oh, wait, was that Hillary Clinton's book? I think it takes a village to raise that was an the working idiot. title. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just regressed. Um, but, you know, it does take a village to raise a, uh, a, it takes a village of ESG enablers. Sorry, I was thinking of it, it Hillary's book, It Takes a Village to Raise an Idiot. Uh, but in your chapter, it takes a village of ESG enablers. We we need to band together and, and either buy products and and also I'm going to uh, kind of hype hop in here again. The you mentioned the oil and gas industry does not do a great job. We have got to do a better job also um, standing up. And a few times, like Jamie Diamond has stood up and said, uh, if we get rid of oil and gas, we'll be in hell. Uh, life would be hell or something. We need more of those kind of comments uh, going around defending ourselves. Uh, what advice would you give to some of the oil and gas execs? Yeah, it's it's interesting covering the industry over the last twenty years because you know nothing really has changed, you know, since <laughs> roughly two thousand seven. Um, and right. if you, you probably remember back then when everyone was going after coal, you had uh, Aubrey McClendon at Chesapeake running ads that say coal is filthy, and then you had T Boone Pickens also with his CNG play piling on coal. Right. And I remember thinking at the time. You know, this is not going to go well. It's eventually going to come back to bite us. Right. And and we're still seeing the same arguments being made right now. So you have EQT with Toby Rice making the right. perfectly logical argument that we should export LNG from the U.S. because it will reduce emissions in the third world if it displaces coal. So it's basically the same argument that we were making 20 years ago about displacing coal in this country. Right. And the only thing that it's got us is, you know, a runoff situation with our own coal industry. <laughs> and, and That's funny. I, I actually, I mean, you think about it and, and Toby is right. It does save. Uh, in fact, there was an article that just came out yesterday that said that P Pennsylvania is now exporting more energy uh, electricity and it's because of their new natural gas plants. And I found it kind of, you know, here's Pennsylvania with coal, uh, everywhere. And now they're reducing their, uh, CO2 by having more natural gas plants and exporting more electricity to the surrounding States using natural gas. I found that as a total oxymoron. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, actually we can talk about this. I think Pennsylvania concerns me just given okay. what's happened in Colorado, but but so it's it's a logical argument using the climate argument against itself, right? Natural right. gas has always had a smaller carbon footprint based on what they told us. Right. But the other side doesn't care. Uh, and all you've done is concede the original premise, which is that climate change is bad. We have to get emissions down. And right. then you're just involved in this execution debate, right? Right. So- I think the industry has been stuck in the bargaining phase for the last 20 years, really, because everyone thinks that they will be the last survivor 
the last one who's allowed to stand, whether you're the an integrated like Exxon and Chevron, or you're a natural gas player with a smaller carbon footprint. But I think the reality is the other side means it when we don't want any more fossil fuels. Right. So at the end, they're coming for you no matter why. And at that right. point, no one's going to help defend you. So. Well it, it, it well said, Paul. I like the way you phrase that. And it's kind of like at COP28 in Dubai this year. Um, I mean, and the head of Dubai says, well, fossil fuels quite ain't dead yet. They're like, kind of like, uh, I'm not quite dead yet out of Monty Python. And I mean, it was absolutely a hoot when everybody was like, no, no, no. They were trying to word it so that it'd be, yes, we'll be dead. No. He stands up there and says, well, no. Then you have Janet Yellen. Janet Yellen says inflation is transitory. I, I, I'd like to say natural gas is not transitory, and it's going to be around a while. <laughs> I mean, it's going to be here. We're going to have to have it. It's the only nuclear, natural gas. Coal is back in style. I mean, there is more natural gas plants and coal plants being put up than you can possibly imagine. If you get back to another example of the logic of the whole argument, you know, ESG and, and climate change is basically the responsibility of the developed world, not the third world, right? right? So they're held to a different standard. So if you look since the Paris Agreement was passed in 2015, for every one gigawatt of coal generation capacity that we've shut down in right. the developed world, we've added two new gigawatts in the third world, mainly in China and India, right? Right. So clearly, we're doing nothing to solve that <laughs> supposed problem. And there, there's clearly a two-tiered system that we have right. here, which is why, you know, I think we need to, if we're going to push back on this effectively, we need to, like, acknowledge that reason's not going to work. So with EQT, thinking that we can unleash LNG and the other side is going to be fine about shutting down coal right. plants, they're not because it's only in the developed world where we're okay putting coal miners out of work. Right. We're not going to do it for political reasons in a developing country. It, and, and what are your thoughts on AI? Because uh, you take a look at Amazon, they just purchased a small nuclear reactor uh, in order to build a data center and data centers are coming online like you wouldn't believe. And there's a group of data centers in Kentucky and they can't even afford the energy there now. Um, and if we bring off the uh, natural gas baseline, I mean, excuse me, the coal baseline that the Biden administration wants to, we're not going to be able to have the AI data centers that they want. I mean, this is just going to exacerbate the whole problem, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it just, just shows you that it, it's it's crazy to think that we can electrify the entire economy, vehicles, you know, the entire transportation sector, at the same time that we're putting in intermittent wind and solar generation, right? right. So those two, you know, should not go <laughs> together. And, and the fact that now we have all these uh, electric dependent data centers, there's going to be more of a draw on the system, so they'll put more pressure on it. Right. So that just, I think, will highlight some of these problems to the extent that you don't get standalone generation attached to some of these sites, which maybe that's the solution. So it doesn't stress out the rest of the already stressed system. Right. Um, but again, we, we need to get back to why are we building nuclear anymore? I mean, everyone's talking about, well, maybe we can do smaller modular nuclear. France has continued to build the same size reactors for right. years, right? We can't do this in this country, right? Uh, you know, the two that were completed finally by Southern uh, Southern Company, they cost $25 billion, right? And they wow. were years overdue, right? Uh, so we have to come up with something that'll streamline the regulatory approval and maybe streamline the financing so that we can deliver, you know, 1000 megawatt reactors on a timely basis, right? Yep. But let's not talk about why we have to come up with this new technology. We know how to build nuclear reactors. We were doing it fine up until 1980. And, right. you know, then we stopped because of its safety yeah. issues, even though it's zero emitting. And, right. and we still can't seem to, to, to restart and, it. And it's nuts. I mean, I was visiting with uh, uh, Grace uh, Stanky. She's the 
uh, last year's Miss America and she was in Dubai and she's a nuclear uh, enthusiast and got her degree in nuclear engineering and she's often running around espousing about nuclear energy. And Dubai, uh, the UAE has just put their uh, second reactor online. It's it's one plant, uh, two reactors, and it's providing uh, 25% of the UAE's electrical grid support. Uh, and it was on time, under budget, and three years, I think, is what it, is all it took, three or four years. Why, why can't we do that? I mean... That just seems so foreign to me. Well, well short regulations. Answer <laughs> short answer is we don't want to. The, the politicians driving this, because obviously if you were worried about emissions from the, the power sector, you'd be building only nuclear, right? Right. Right, because that's dispatchable and it's got zero emissions, right? Yeah, and you mentioned France. France uh, has, uh, I believe, 52 nuclear uh, reactors in their fleet but they're only able to run about 20, uh, 50% of their fleet because they spent almost no money. Uh, Paul, like you were saying is that there was, they went through a group of time where they were not putting any money back into the maintenance on those things. So they were held a, a hostage to the people in charge saying nuclear is bad. Well, now they're like going, these things are busted and can't even be repaired. So can you imagine if you had uh, 50 nuclear, we have what, 94, I believe in the U S imagine if we had 180, we well, wouldn't, we wouldn't be having the problem that we have now. No. And those 94 are, are fairly long in the tooth. So we really need to figure this thing out. Uh, if we want to have a Renaissance around nuclear power. You bet. Well, Paul, your book is critical. And again, I want to just put out here that I thoroughly enjoyed my talking to you and getting to know you. And I hope this is not the last time I get to visit with you. Uh, for people on the book, the book again is Race to Zero, How ESG Investing Will Crater the Global Financial System. And I'm going to just say, Paul, because I've been on this side of it for years talking about it from an energy side this book is very well organized and articulated and even has the uh end notes is stuffed with things that for me to even go look at again so i think you've done an outstanding job uh putting all this together and i'm sorry for being nice to you on a friday afternoon but you did a great job paul yeah yeah, my, my main goal was to have a book that anyone could pick up and read so that it was not filled with financial jargon. And I I don't think you need to, to be someone who's worked in the industry to understand what's going on. Right. You did you and you nailed it. And what you did do is you gave a financial perspective to energy that a lot of folks from the energy side don't look at it this way. So it, it was a very refreshing read. And uh, I love your Mark Mills intro in here as well, too. A shout out to Mark Mills uh, uh, on that. So what's coming around the corner next for you? Uh, well, in the process of marketing the book right now. And, uh, and then I'm going to figure out exactly what, you know, I'm going to be doing to really promote, um, you know, my ideas around ESG I'm going to stay involved with the energy sector as an advocate. So the hard work is done after writing the book. Now the easy part is to kind of just figure out what the platform is. So it will include social media and, uh, you know, check this space. I'll probably have news shortly. Oh, fantastic. Well, I'll tell you what, uh, the offer is always here. If you have announcements, if you uh, have notes that you want to put out, send me a note. We'll get them out and published on our channels and get everything out there for you. So thank you so much. How do people get a hold of you? Uh, you can reach me through um, NYU Stern, uh, where I teach, or okay. I'm on social media through LinkedIn or Twitter. Okay. We'll have all those in the show notes and uh, also how to buy the book. We will have embedded in the show notes as well, too. So thank you very much, Paul, for stopping by. I appreciate you. you. I appreciate it.